This morning, um, we are get really lucky to have um, today this am amazing uh, uh, discussion with our U.S. Chief Technology Officer, Michael Kratzios, which is moder moderated by Eileen Donahue. She's going to introduce uh, Michael, but uh, let me introduce Eileen first. She's the Executive Director of the Global Digital Policy Incubator at the Stanford Cyber Policy Center. She focuses on developing global digital policies that address human rights, security, and governance challenges. Before Stanford, she was the first U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Human Rights Council during the Obama administration. She also served as the director of global affairs at Human Rights Watch, and she serves on the boards of numerous organizations, including the National Endowment for Democracy and the World Economic Forum Council on the Future of Human Rights. Eileen, the floor is yours. So thank you so much for this opportunity. It is my honor and pleasure to have this Stanford High conversation with Michael Kratzios, the Chief Technology Officer of the United States. Michael was unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate in August of this year to serve as CTO. He is just the fourth person in the United States to serve in this role. As U.S. CTO, Michael serves as the President's Principal Advisor on a very broad portfolio of tech policy challenges, ranging from quantum computing, 5G and rural broadband, autonomous vehicles, commercial drones, STEM education, advanced manufacturing, as well as AI. Prior to becoming CTO, Michael served in the White House as deputy CTO, starting in the very early days of the administration. And prior to entering government, he was a principal at Teal Capital and served as chief of staff to entrepreneur investor Peter Teal. He graduated from Princeton with a degree in political science. Welcome, Michael Kratzios. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to spend about a half an hour in conversation, and then we'll turn to the audience and see what questions you would like to ask. Before I get into a US AI policy specifically, I want to talk a little bit about your personal experience working on US tech policy in the White House. Then we'll get into some questions about global competition in AI, US domestic AI policy, and US leadership in the international realm, uh, and with respect to global governance norms. So my first question is simply, what is it like to be CTO of the United States. Um, you, you know, you came into government with a background in investing and a degree in political science. I think the students in the audience would be very curious to know how that background ha has informed your work, has helped you. Um, so just tell us about your experience in the White House. Yeah, absolutely. As, as sort of we were discussing backstage, this is probably the, uh, the, the greatest job that I've ever had in my life, and uh, I, I absolutely am, am thrilled to come to work every day. Uh, to me, I sort of began my, my career in, uh, in, I guess, the, in, in tech here in, in Silicon Valley. I worked for almost seven years, uh, you know, looking at investing in and advising technology companies. And, uh, you know, during that, that time um, here, in, here in San Francisco, I think one of the things that we started sort of seeing over, over the, the course of, of my time was that, you know, the, the emphasis and the work that we were doing as investors on the, the regulatory risk associated with our investments continued to grow over time. So the firm where I used to work, we invested in companies like SpaceX, like Airbnb, Airbnb, like Stripe. These were all companies that were working in very highly regulated areas. And a lot of disruption you're seeing in the last you know, five or six years in generally in, in tech is in places where, uh, where regulation is somehow a cr created you know, mar market winner. So to have the opportunity to kind of think about the, the creating a regulatory environment that actually supports innovation was something that was, was always interesting to me. Um, so after the election, I sort of joined the, joined the transition effort and we had a very sort of unique opportunity to start shaping what the, the tech agenda would be for, uh, for this administration. Uh, during the campaign, technology was not something that the president had spoken about um, very specifically, but he had some very core themes around sort of how he thought about the world, things like American exceptionalism, the power of the American worker, uh, unfair trade deals. And if you're able to sort of take those, those very high-level thematic things and kind of boil them down into a, into a tech policy agenda was a very incredible sort of intellectual exercise for all of us on the team as we were attempting to, to kind of develop the strategy going forward. Um, 
so kind of out of the gate, I think we kind of set the, the core high-level agenda to be American leadership in emerging technology. You know, we fundamentally believe that the U.S. must lead the world in next-generation technologies, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's quantum computing, whether it's 5G. In order to do so, it's critical for a number of reasons, for, the, for our economic growth, for job creation in the U.S., for national security, and also really for this, and all of those seem to really hit on the, the importance of regulation in this space. Again, how do we create that environment in the U.S. that fosters fosters innovation. And kind of out of the gates, we wanted to really have one sort of tangible example to kind of lift up and sort of speak very publicly about as, as something, as, as kind of what we're talking about. And we settled on, on commercial drones as kind of our first example. And this one's very interesting because we have fantastic American companies that have generated great technologies. We have some of the most amazing companies in the world, companies like Amazon, companies like Google, who are all attempting to do commercial drone ops. But the issue is that because of our inability to create a regulatory system that allows them to do operations here in the U.S. legally, they're doing it abroad. You had, you know, Amazon testing in the U.K., you had Google testing in Australia, and there are many other examples. So this serves as a, as a really good example of what we're talking about. If you can actually fix that regulatory environment and create sort of a safe way to integrate the airspace, then we can make a really, really big difference. Um, so that was kind of our, our leg number one, that we kind of sort of launched the, the larger initiative on emerging tech. And then from there, we spent the last two years building national strategies on things like AI and quantum and 5G, and happy to get into any of that. Well, so I want to stay on the personal front. Um, how do you even manage this gigantic portfolio in terms of thinking about your own bandwidth mm -hmm. and then within that portfolio um, how what have you really prioritized there's a couple of ways to think about it. I think the, the federal government is massive. We have incredible agencies that, that do incredible work. Places like DOE Science that runs all of our national labs. We have uh, places like the National Science Foundation, like DARPA, like IARPA, and so on. And the role that the White House usually plays in this system is a convener to help drive the actual efforts that are done at the agency level. So mm -hmm. we spend a lot of time building high-level strategies and like top-level directives, and those kind of are, are baked in through, through the process. For me, I think, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of sort of startups and entrepreneurs in, in my in, in the private sector and to me I saw this opportunity as one that was sort of very entrepreneurial in nature for us it was when we showed up kind of the day after inauguration, it was just you know, a couple of folks. And over the past two years, we've built out a very robust team of sort of brilliant minds from all around the world who can help work on these issues. So for us, recruiting is a big, a big chunk of time because we want individual portfolio managers that know the issue. So for example, Dr. Lynn Parker, who's a roboticist from the University of Tennessee, runs our artificial intelligence portfolio. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jake Taylor from the University of Maryland runs our, our quantum portfolio. And the list kind of goes on and on. I think we've been able to recruit people from some of the best universities, and some of our greatest agencies to come who have the technical expertise to be able to drive this important policy. Um, so for me, kind of how we split up our time, I would say probably a third of my time is spent on actual policy development. So working with our policy advisors on kind of what the next steps are and kind of what policy priorities are. Um, I'd say a third of my time is spent dealing with uh, a lot of sort of stakeholder engagement. So meeting with people from around the country who have issues that they want to bring to the White House that they want us to focus on or think about. Uh, and then a third of our time is getting, getting the message out. We have uh, amazing initiatives and launch national strategies on things like AI and quantum and talking to folks like people in this room and like making them aware of kind of what we're working on and how they can help us and, and how we can we can uh, work with them better is something we think about a lot. Great. Um, so are there any notable areas where the Trump administration has chosen to make a big shift in direction on tech policy away from priorities in the Obama administration? Or would you say that there has largely been continuity between administrations on tech policy? You know, I would say just given what we're, the topic of today, I would say there's been a, a great continuation. So as many of you may know, the Obama administration had a really fantastic effort at the tail end of of, uh, kind of 2015 and 2016 around starting to discuss the implications of artificial intelligence on the policy landscape. And they held a number of events at a number of universities around the country and started talking to AI experts, to people in civil society, to policymakers, to start having the conversation. And they, they, uh, they produced a report at the end of, kind of at the end of 2016 around sort of potential policy impacts that, that could happen because of artificial intelligence. They also released a really great um, R&D strategic plan on AI. So they had identified seven areas in, in uh, sort of AI fundamental research that need to be focused on, and this was something that a lot of our agencies started, started allocating grant money to. So for us, when we came in, I mean, this was a, a really great foundation for our work going forward, and we built on that, and we kind of decided that, okay, this was a great, a great start. We had a really good policy conversation of what, what 
could happen or what we should be thinking about. And we took that one, one step further and actually built and launched a national strategy via executive order that was, that was launched earlier this year. So to us, I think a lot of the issues that we deal with in our office, especially on tech policy, are not particularly partisan. This idea that we want the world, we want the US to lead the world in artificial intelligence, or we want to lead the world in quantum computing is not something that really has sort of political boundaries. It's something that all of us can come together and agree on. Okay, I could go to AI domestic policy, but I, I first want to talk about the, the challenge of global competition yep. in tech and AI. There, everybody in this room knows there's been a tremendous amount of commentary about the relationship between the United States and China mm -hmm. with respect to technology, and questions raised about the extent to which the U.S. private sector companies and academic institutions should or should not be collaborating even on basic research mm -hmm. with Chinese entities. Um, so, and there's also been a lot of speculation about who will dominate in AI or control the future of quantum computing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how would you characterize the dynamic between the United States and China when it comes to AI? And what guidance would you give to US research universities and private sector tech companies when it comes to collaborating with China even on basic research? Yeah, so on, to kind of break that down, I think on the, the first part on the sort of U.S. versus China dynamic of where we had it, I think we, we gave remarks a couple weeks ago um, around this particular issue. And, you know, our belief is that the U.S. is leading the world in artificial intelligence. We have the best universities. We have the most startups. We have the most private sector investment. Um, and the list kind of goes on on kind of the stats that kind of can, can defend that. That being said, the Chinese are very much focused on trying to catch up with us. And they've been very explicit in their desire to try to, to, try to get there by the end of the next the next decade. Um, so for us, that's why American leadership is so important. That's why we have launched this national initiative. And that's why all of our efforts around AI leadership center around finding a way to leverage the uniqueness of the U.S. ecosystem in driving discovery. So for us, you know, our, our approach in the U.S. to driving scientific discovery and technological discovery the last 50 years is very unique. It's not something that you have in most places around the world. We have an extraordinarily sort of vibrant private sector that does incredible research and commercialization work. We have the best university in the world with incredible academics who do a lot of the basic research. And then we have the federal government which funds about $150 billion billion dollars a year of basic R&D. And this is a sort of a, a free market approach to innovation, where the federal government funds researchers at universities to, to explore new domains, to look at new basic research projects. They come up with fantastic discoveries. Those are ultimately scooped up private, private sector and commercialized. And the system kind of is able to sort of generate results. And this is very different than sort of a, a centrally planned industrial policy that some of our adversaries are pursuing. And everything that we do, whether our strategies on AI or quantum, are sort of centered on, on maximizing the output of this unique U.S. innovation ecosystem. So we always ask ourselves, what is it that the federal government has that the private sector and academia don't that we can maximize and push out? So we have, for example, high-performance computing infrastructure. Four of the top ten fastest supercomputers in the world are housed at national labs run by the Department of Energy. Those assets should be made available and useful to the community of researchers who want to make discoveries. We fund, for example, as a federal government, lots of grants and fellowships to students all around the country to pursue uh, advanced degrees. We should be focusing those dollars on the areas that matter most to the country, things like artificial intelligence. And both those examples are things that the president asked for in, in, the, uh, in the executive order. Now on the question of research security, I think that's equally important and I think it's something that we think about a lot all the time. So our director, Dr. Kelvin Drogmeyer, who runs the Office of Science and Technology Policy, is a former VP of research at the University of Oklahoma. And one of his signature initiatives that he's been driving over this year is this initiative around uh, research environments and creating research environments that have integrity, and I think that's what's key. For us, it's, you know, the integrity of the scientific process is so, so important, and that includes things like disclosure and transparency around where researchers, no matter where you come from around the world or even from the U.S., should be made very aware who is funding you, where you're coming from, and in that way, we can make better decisions as a research environment of the type of research that we believe in and trust. So you talked a lot about the unique U.S. ecosystem and the innovative culture we have. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you a little bit more specifically, in which aspects of AI technology would you say the U.S. is dominant? And over what time horizon should we be expecting that to continue? And mm -hmm. where would you say China is challenging us in dominance? 
Yeah, I think for our view, I think the one place that we that they, they probably are challenging us is on generally on machine vision. I think they have far more data around that particular domain given the way that they sort of have their own surveillance state, if you will, and the accessibility of data around sort of around sort of the, the, these visual elements. So for us, I think that's one place where we probably see that you know um, you know they're they're moving ahead on a little bit further. But you know, generally speaking, I think we lead the world. So uh, backup question that was raised in the conversation yesterday between Maricha and Eric Schmidt mm -hmm. um, is the question of to what extent would you say the quantity of data collected and available will be the determinative factor, a determinative factor mm -hmm. in, when it comes to dominance in AI? So I think it's a determinant factor. I think there's obviously it makes a huge difference, and in the short term, there's a lot of subdomains of AI which can make a you could you could do, make a big difference by um, by using more data, and it's something that we identified in the executive order and, and is one of our big pillars of the actual American AI initiative, which is how do you get more data available given sort of the the, the privacy constraints and similarity constraints that are so dear and important to us here in the here in the United States. So we're actively looking for ways to unearth or, or get out data that the federal government can controls, which can be useful for researchers, and the list will go on. That being said, we continue to do and fund important research on ways that we're able to sort of get over these data humps. For example, homomorphic encryption is something that DARPA has been looking at and many researchers are. So we can find a way to sort of protect PII or personal information as best as possible. That's what we want to do. Um, but I think ultimately there's, there's a future where, you know, there's lots of, of subdomains of AI that don't necessarily need as much data. And I think the, the fundamental research around how you can train models with less data is something that a lot of our federal grants are going towards. Okay, so I want to turn a little bit now to the relationship between U.S. private sector tech companies and the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. um, so a number of American tech companies have faced public criticism as well as deep internal tensions between employees and executives over their work with and for the U.S. government, especially DOD, immigration services, and law enforcement. Mm -hmm. To what extent has it been your job for the United States government to make the case that American private sector companies uh, should be partnering with the U.S. government? And to what extent are you engaging with the employees of these companies? So there's a couple of threats. I think for, for starters, at a very high level, there is sort of whoever is in office, um, there's no stakeholder community where that particular person sees eye to eye with the stakeholder on every single issue. So it's not surprising that, that this administration or any administration doesn't see eye to eye on every single issue with the tech community. So for us, you know, what we try to do is find places where we do see eye to eye and really maximize and, and push hard on the gas on trying to find ways to get the most out of that, um, um, out of that particular issue. So a great example example is on STEM education. We signed a, uh, a presidential memorandum in, in 2017 that directed the Secretary of, of Education to prioritize STEM education uh, with a focus on computer science uh, and increase spending in that area by about $200 million. The next day we had a group of technology companies come out and publicly commit $300 million towards STEM ed. So, you know, in a matter of, of a day, a single signature by the President of the United States led to a half billion dollars of commitments to STEM education in our country. So we really, for us, it's finding places where we do agree and getting the most out of that, that relationship. That being said, I think, you know, the, the issue of, you know, governments working with technology companies is something that um, I believe is, is critically important and we need to continue to, to kind of focus on. And it's something that, again, isn't necessarily, necessarily, par isn't necessarily partisan. So if you look at sort of the deputy CTO from the last administration, Jen Palka, who, you know, ran, ran Code for America, I think she wrote a very, um, very insightful a lot better around the, the, the importance of sort of equipping our warfighters uh, with the latest and greatest technology. The idea that the men and women in uniform in faraway lands who are defending and protecting our freedoms and our liberties here in the United States don't have the best technology to do their job is, is terrifying. And, that's, and, and I think for us, we need to be able to find a way to sort of create those relationships. 
You know, that being said, I think some of the sort of anecdotal examples that tend to get a lot of the headlines are not really indicative of, of the relationship that, that our, especially our DOD has with the tech community. There's an incredible organization called DIU, if you hadn't heard of it, that has great connections with lots of startups and lots of organizations that are trying to create technology to, 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 support, our, to support our military. And for us, it's we should focus on the places where we do have a good relationship and maximize that. And I think some of the other ones are, are a little bit of noise sometimes. Yeah. It's surprising to me how there's still that very high-level debate. You know, Microsoft, Palantir have come out on one side, Google's come out on the other side. I think their employees feel very differently about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that high-level narrative is something the U.S. government needs to be working on. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to turn a little more specifically now to a U.S. AI policy, starting with domestic policy and the national AI strategy. So as you mentioned, on February 11th to the, this year, the president signed an executive order launching the American AI Initiative, the broad purpose of which was to maintain American leadership in AI. So tell us tell about the elements of that initiative. What was the impetus behind it? Um, and what does it signal uh, about the priority be, being given to AI by the US government? Yeah, so I think for, for starters, you know, we came to the administration, we knew we wanted to, to kind of generate and drive a national strategy because we knew this was imperative for, um, for our country. And we launched, we did, we started kind of with an event called AI for American Industry that we hosted in, uh, in March of, of last year. And that was our attempt to sort of bring the community together to discuss this, this very important issue. And we framed it around industry um, and had sort of individual threads for folks in agriculture, for folks in healthcare and finance and tech. And I think what we tried to show at that event was that AI was something that is impacting all Americans, whether you're doing resource extraction in Texas, whether you're doing you know, medical-related work in Boston, whether you're doing agriculture in Iowa, you will be impacted by this technology. So we want to hear from the entire community as we kind of brought together the national strategy, ask them what they want to see in it. What is it, again, the fundamental question always is, how can the federal government contribute to the innovation ecosystem in the U.S.? What can we do as a federal government that we're not doing now to help drive, drive this forward? So, Taking all that feedback and going and running a policy process in, in our building can, can take some time, but we finally got over the finish line and, and the president signed it in February. So the, the key elements of it really, I think, boil down to kind of three key themes. So the first line of effort is around research and development leadership. You know, we fundamentally believe it again, we need to lead the world in the basic research discoveries that are going to be driving the commercialization of this product for years to come. And again, what can we do from sort of our seat there is bring together the various agencies that spend lots and lots of money on our artificial intelligence and get them to be working and coordinating in a way that they maybe haven't been before. So we launched something called the Select Committee on AI, which actually has all, has the most senior level science and, and sort of R&D related officials in the federal government who meet quarterly to kind of discuss and coordinate on, on AI. Um, we've also prioritized AI in the uh, budget to Congress. So this was the first time in history that the president ever prioritized artificial intelligence. And we've done it in all of ours beginning from the first time we were, we were in office. Um, so that was, that was really pillar one, which is on is R&D leadership. And that discusses some of the high performance computing stuff that I talked about earlier, opening those up to researchers, uh, and also sort of a grants and fellowship stuff. Um, the second piece of the strategy is around the American worker, this belief that, um, you know, really you know, pushing the idea that artificial intelligence is a tool that actually empowers American workers to do their jobs better, safer, faster, more effectively. And for us, it's, it's you know, we realize that this technology will cause displacement. You know, in our office, we're not necessarily you know, the right person to opine on, you know, what the, the, the speed or the scale of that particular change, but we know that it's happening. And for us, again, what can the federal government do? It's about optimizing our programs at places like labor to, to sort of put them in a position where they can help retrain and reskill Americans in a way that makes the most sense. And what the executive order did was it, it focused not only on, on the contribution that the feds can make, but it also this realization that we're in this together. It's not just the federal government, it's also the private sector. And a great Great example of this is an effort called the, the Pledge to the American to the American Worker, where we essentially have gone out to American companies and asked them, can you make a commitment to retrain or reskill Americans over the next five years? And we've done that over for over a year now, and we've had some pretty good results. We've had over 300 companies make this pledge, and they've 
pledge to, uh, to retrain or reskill over 14 million Americans in the next five years. So that's line of effort two. Um, and line of effort three is around regulations. This idea that we need to create a regulatory environment that actually encourages innovation in the AI space. In some ways, we like to talk about it in a way of removing barriers to AI innovation, finding ways where and pathways to actually allow this technology to be commercialized. If you're a drone operator, you can't fly your drone for commercial purposes at night over people or beyond visual line of sight without a waiver. If you're an autonomous vehicle manufacturer, you can't go sell your product on the road and put Americans in it. If you are a designer of an AI-powered medical diagnostic, it's going to take you five to ten years to get that diagnostic approved by the FDA. So these were all issues where we wanted to find a way to, to, to create a cleaner regulatory path for AI-powered technologies while at the same time protecting the very important privacy and civil liberties that we hold so dear. So a big action that's coming out of that and our first kind of step in that is, uh, is, the, is a regulatory guidance memo that's going to come out from the White House probably in about a month or so out to the agencies that's going to give them guidance on uh, the way they should be thinking about regulatory or non-regulatory approaches to AI-powered technologies. Um, and this obviously is a very sort of challenging document we've been working on for some time because the same type of guidance needs to apply to the guy at the FDA and also to the guy at the Department of Transportation. So um, I think this is a memo that's going to go out for public comment next month, and I encourage all of you to, to kind of take a look at it, let us know everything we did wrong, tear it to shreds, and then we'll try to fix it and get it back out there for you. And, um, and then once that goes out to the agencies, the agencies will then be required to send uh, documents documentation back up to the White House on how they're actually uh, implementing that, uh, that particular reg. So let me just touch on one issue there. I think a lot of the conversation around AI seems to raise, in fact, you know, one of the questions yesterday, I think the last question in the conversation between Maricha and Eric was about the tension between innovation and values mm -hmm. and how do you hold both of those things together in, and lead in both realms. So um, I'm very pleased that this American AI initiative um, puts an emphasis on protecting American values, including human rights, privacy, civil liberties. Um, so say a little bit more about the importance of those normative values to American leadership. Yeah, those are, those are absolutely critical. And I think our, our first manifestation of that was our, our work with the, with the OECD this past, uh, this past year. Um, you know, we recognize the, you know, the, the U.S. had not signed on or made any statement as, a, as an administration or as a government on principles around the development of artificial intelligence. And uh, we a long time were, were thinking very carefully about what the right venue for that was. And we had a great opportunity to work with the OECD over the course of, of almost a year to develop um, uh, AI principles. And, you know, I was in Paris in, in March and, uh, sorry, in May, and, and it was the first time that the U.S. signed on to these. And this was an example of us coming together with other Western liberal democracies and saying these are the values that we hold dear and these are the values we want to see underpinning the development of artificial intelligence. And for us, I think this was a huge, huge step. I mean, from, a, from an administration that is very skeptical generally about multilateral agreements, we made the decision to, to join this, this 38 country agreement on, on AI principles. And those are the types of things that you'll see sort of potentially threaded and baked into some of the work that we're doing with, uh, with the regulatory guidance memo. And for me, when I sort of see the world, you know, and kind of see why, the, why these are so important, I mean, we have adversaries in other countries around the world who are using artificial intelligence to surveil other people, to imprison minorities, to flagrantly violate human rights. And those are the types of values that we cannot see exported or do not want to see exported around the globe. So that is why American leadership in artificial intelligence is so critical. We need to be the nation that makes the, na the next great breakthrough. We need to be the nation that commercializes the next AI product because we want our values to be underpinning the use cases there. So that's why it's so critical. So on the regulatory front uh, and this um, question of values. Um, one of the particular AI technologies that's r raised significant civil liberties concerns in the U.S. and globally has mm -hmm. been facial recognition. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, rather than the usual stance of resisting regulation, some private sector companies and leaders have explicitly called for federal government regulation of facial recognition, most notably Brad Smith from Microsoft. Um, We've also seen a few instances of local governments regulating uh, facial recognition, San Francisco, Oakland, uh, I think Springfield, Mass, and maybe Berkeley, um, in terms of government use and law enforcement. Mm -hmm. 
Um, do you expect gov federal regulation in facial recognition anytime soon, uh, even with respect to just government use of f facial recognition? And um, if no actual regulation, what do you think the parameters of the guidelines might be as it relates to facial recognition? Yeah, I, I think this is an example of where sort of a, a, a patchwork of regulation around this technology is not beneficial for the country or for, for most Americans. And I think just like we are sort of skeptical about the way that sort of some of this privacy legislation is proceeding with sort of a, a potential case where there's sort of each state has their own, own privacy rules, I think we want to avoid that in the case of, of uh, facial recognition. I think, you know, we're, you know, my general office's position is that facial recognition has a very, very important important roles that it can play in, in functions that the government makes. I think one you know, great example that sort of Microsoft put out when they made their call for regulation was you know, in, in New Delhi they used, um, they were making an effort to sort of help find lost and displaced children. In a matter of three days they were able to locate over 4,000 children who had, who had gone missing. So there's certainly use cases where it does make sense to use, uh, to use facial recognition. But I think what's critically important is that these use cases are underpinned by the same very important values that we've, we've talked about repeatedly just previously. So as we, as we work through that process as, uh, as, as a federal government, we will make sure that the very critical sort of civil, civil liberties and values that we hold so dear are baked into the, into the use cases. Great. Um, just on the prospect of federal regulation on other aspects of AI, um, there are a number of bills that have been drafted and introduced related to algorithmic accountability, transparency, explainability of AI, yeah. Yeah. and others related to the economic impacts and labor displacement. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent is US AI policy seen as a bipartisan issue? Um, and if it is bipartisan, what's holding up regulation? Well, uh, yeah, I don't think we should be running to regulate anything. So just let's hold there for a second. But uh, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> but, that's gen fair. but generally speaking, I think it, it is a bipartisan issue, and I think most uh, you know most of these bills that you see are all have all been introduced with by you know bipartisan um, bipartisan folks. I, I, I think the, the the issue is there's 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 a lot there isn't as much. I think that's why events like these are so important because sort of the the, the knowledge or understanding in Washington around the implications that that rules or, or regs around this technology could have are not not abundantly clear. I think to us when you know we sort of look at the world and you know why has the US been a place where we have been a leader in technological innovations not because we've had great regs on 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 technology it's because we've had taken a free market approach to innovation and uh, sort of the way that I sort of view the world is there's there's technologies that are sort of born free or technologies that are that are born in captivity and we've done an incredible job in the US to, to really drive innovation and growth in technologies that are born free places like the internet entire digital economy and technologies that are sort of born in captivity things like drones autonomous vehicles those continue to be lagging behind where the technology is going so I think we want to be cautious about jumping to to regulation the other thing that, that that's very that, that's very tricky around a lot of this proposed regulation is things like explainability I mean we're on a college campus here we have great researchers who think about this all the time if you asked any you know computer scientist who works on the explainability question they would tell you it, it still remains to be determined how you can actually do explainability. There's no science behind having explainable AI. So though, if you create a regulation that says if you use AI it has to be explainable, you've got a real problem because the science isn't there yet. So I think for us as, as our administrators, we try to focus a lot on the, on, the, on the research that underpins a lot of these future regulatory decisions. The other thing that, that I think is critical to remember in sort of the regulatory posture is that you know, AI is, is another tool that's being used by all sorts of industries and technologies to make them better in a way. So you know, the, the, the type of regulation that is useful for the AI use case in an autonomous vehicle is very different than the use case of artificial intelligence in a um, AI-powered medical diagnostic. And we have decades long of sort of regulatory understanding that exists at each of those agencies. And one thing you'll probably see in the regulatory guidance memo is that you know, the, the regulations need to be tailored and to be, spe you know, sector specific. The idea that you're going to have, you know, a, a Ten Commandments of, of AI regs that's going to work for every type of sector just doesn't make sense. So for us, it's, you know, having smart people like you guys communicating with our regulators across all of our agencies uh, so we can make a smart, a smart set of rules. Great. I, I have one more question, and I think we'll go to the audience and see what you'd like to ask. Um, 
the sort of the big picture question is there's a lot of hope and optimism that AI will be used for good to support human dignity, enhance liberty, facilitate economic development, fulfill the U UN Sustainable Development Goals. On the other hand, there's also a great deal of concern that in the big scheme of things, it's equally likely that AI will be used to do the opposite, restrict civil liberties, undermine all of those things, human dignity and autonomy, and basically facilitate this global drift toward digital authoritarianism. Mm. Um, and I, I'm thinking back to a conversation, I think it was on this stage where Peter Thiel and Reid Hoffman had a conversation and they debated that issue of which way they thought AI was more likely to lead the world. So what's your assessment of the likelihood of those two scenarios, the positive and the, and the, the dystopian? Um, and what can we do? What can everybody here do? What can the US government do to make sure that um, human rights, democratic values, rule of law are actually protected in the AI-driven societies? Mm -hmm. Look, I fundamentally believe and in, in, in deeply believe in the ability of the, of the U.S. sort of innovation ecosystem to continue to drive innovation in this space. And that's what we've been working on for years and will we'll continue to do so. And I think, as I said a little before, I think if, if the U.S. can continue to be a leader in artificial intelligence, we can ensure that the values that we hold so dear are the ones that are going to be underpinning the development globally. So that is why there's such an imperative for U.S. leadership. That being said, I think we need to continue to work with our closest Western allies in developing and promoting this, this technology. That is why we did things like go to the OECD and join with some of our Western democratic allies to talk about these issues. And whether it's research exchanges or whether it's better coordination among, among these democracies, that is something that's key because we need to continue to lead the world to have the next generation of technologies underpinned by our, by our values. And if we do that, we're going to continue to, 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 continue to, to win out and, and kind of... Uh, you know, push back on some of these other folks who don't feel the same way we do. So innovation and normative values can work together. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so let's open it up to the audience. I, I see John right here. So we'll start in the front row and then we'll go over here. Michael, thank you. And First of all, I want to commend you on pushing the, the AI agenda and technology agenda in the administration. I think that's great. I, I also think that you, you've certainly got, you've got the sign right, but not the magnitude. <laughs> and uh, Fei-Fei and I uh, posted a blog post uh, a few days ago mm -hmm. on, on the High website about the investment that we think is required. And it's not just investment, but also the way we do that investment. So we're, we call for $12 billion a year in, in federal investment, at broadly from mm -hmm. K-12 all the way up to university and, 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 um, and startup uh, investment. But um, one of the things I, I think I want to emphasize is that I could not agree more with you about the, uh, the importance of the U.S. ecosystem, research and innovation ecosystem, which is absolutely incredible, and it has served us well. But there are some disadvantages that we're, we're facing now that are sort of pouring sand in the, in the gears. And one of them is the access for university researchers to high compute power, to data sets, and so forth. And, and that could be solved by, by a national research cloud that provides free access to uh, uh, public interest research uh, researchers. And that would take that, that problem away, and I think it would help flower, help the, the ecosystem work the way it's supposed to work. So I, I do hope that you will take a look at that and, and think about not just the amount of investment, but also the strategic form of the investment as well. I guess that's not a question, Eileen, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think you have a, a really good point. I think we obviously work in a sort of constrained budget environment where we try to do our best with kind of what the, the top line figure is that our officer of management budget says we have to meet. That being said, I think what I'm very proud of is that sort of given the, the, the top level constraint that was sort of directed down to, to the agencies, we were able to prioritize artificial intelligence at a level that sort of we've never seen before. And I think we had chat a little bit about this stat. Maybe the, the velocity of the increase isn't as fast as we would like, but 
but but the, the spend at the federal level is is increasing at a pretty pretty good clip. Um, the last uh, R&D budget crosscut on artificial intelligence sort of spending, and this is sort of basic research for for AI um, or research for AI done in in 2016 was in the neighborhood of about a billion or 1.1 billion. Um, as part of the executive order, the president was like, "Look, guys, like we want to spend a lot of money on AI, but we need to know exactly where it's being spent." So one of the directives was do a do a sort of annual budget crosscut where you're looking at what is NIH spending, what is DOD spending, whatever, and so on. Um, and we got the first results of that were actually published uh, about a month and a half ago or about two months ago. And I think what you saw there was for the 2020 budget uh, proposal, I mean, you're already looking at in the neighborhood of about a billion dollars of unclass non-DOD funding. And then if you look at what has been public but the DOD is spending, it's at a minimum another billion or two. So you're seeing at least a doubling or tripling of the, of the total amount of of federal spend on, on AI in a matter of just three or four years. So um, yes, I, I wish we could spend a lot more, and I think we'll continue to advocate that that as an office and spend it in a smart way. The issue you bring up on the uh, on the on the cloud, I think, is one that we're hearing a lot from the, the academic community. I think we have that's why a lot of you know great researchers often find themselves sort of departing universities for short periods of time to go to places that have you know private sector companies that have sort of essentially unlimited compute and lots of data to play with. So if we can help sort of fix some of those constraints or at least, you know, move some of federal resources to help with that, I think it's a fantastic idea. So I'll just quickly follow up. I heard in that um, the idea that there, it's kind of a moment for a wake-up call, that there is greater urgency about the scale of investment that's actually needed to continue in U.S. leadership. So I'm, I'm curious, who should John and Fefe be going to in the U.S. government to, to get their attention? <laughs> Uh, so I, I think as our, as our crosscut showed, there's some of our, our core agencies that spend the most money are the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy um, are, the, are the two big players, and obviously the Department of Defense. So speaking with the R&D leads there, as well as uh, our Director of, uh, of, of Management and Budget. Um, our Congress acting. have a role? Congress has the biggest role. So I, you know, I think you know, they have, um, you know, Past appropriations bills, which are significantly higher than the budget proposals by um, by the by the administration, and there's a lot of people there who are very excited about science, and we work with them very very closely. So, to the extent that you know, when we think about sort of the, the the large amount of dollars that are being appropriated across the board, talking to the appropriators and getting them excited about artificial intelligence can make a big difference. Great. Okay, we had another question right here. Thank you. Ben Schneiderman, University of Maryland. Um, I've come to be aware that the language we use and in, in the terminology and the metaphors guide what happens on the ground. So uh, I'm I, I was very pleased to see you talking about tool-like designs. And Lynn Parker has talked and written extensively and used the language of tools. Yet the, uh, the White House report on uh, strategic AI, the June 19 report, puts a lot of emphasis on autonomous and autonomous systems and machines as our partners, collaborators, teammates. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really dangerous. It leads to designs of 737 MAX, fully autonomous, so much so that the operators don't even, the pilots don't know it's there. So how can the notion of tool-like behavior and, and the move from autonomous to a better set of language that I would say is trusted, reliable, and safe. TRS systems are what people want. TRS cars, not autonomous cars. How can you and Lynn and others help promote that shift that will produce a pro positive outcome rather than the dangers of uh, an autonomous language? Yeah, I think you have a good point. I think language matters a lot. And I think a lot of our efforts to, to kind of speak about sort of trustworthiness, robustness, accountability, fairness, those are all things that are sort of baked in, um, seen in actually the, the OECD principles that we signed and also a lot of the work that NIST has done and sort of their their plan going out for standards around around AI. So I, I, I think you're right. I think we're sort of in this in this situation where when you talk about a, a drone, it's called an autonomous vehicle in, in a way. So I think we're kind of caught up with that where it may not be uh, – you know, uh, uh, perfectly correct. So I think uh, we can be certainly more precise in our language. It's a good point. The studious control of the language will, ha will produce the fortuitous outcomes you want. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I saw two other questions there and there. Uh, thank you. Um, obviously, one major pillar of U.S. innovation 
um, is uh, immigration. And that's obviously something that has been a major bone of contention for this administration. Obviously, it's not under the direct purview of your office, but I wonder if this is something that your office advocates for, um, you know, given the, the current environment. Absolutely, yeah. I think we, as an administration, our office fundamentally believe in a, in a merit-based immigration system, one that rewards the best and brightest people from around the world having the opportunity to come work here, research here, study here, um, and it's something we have, we have pushed for. Um, the idea of you know, baking that into a larger, sort of more comprehensive immigration reform is one that's very politically challenging and one that requires partners on the Hill. So that's, that's something that, that, uh, that obviously we as in Washington general has, has struggled with coming to a consensus. Um, what I will say is there's, there's a few places where, you know, we have made efforts that, um, to, to try to in, improve or move towards a more merit-based immigration system um, in places where we can do so without congressional action. So many of you may be aware of the uh, H-1B visa program. This is a, this is a program that actually um, requires, uh, uh, you know, to go through the process, you go through two separate lotteries where you pool people with advanced degrees and with, without advanced degrees in, in, the same, in the same pools and they do a subsequent lottery and we sort of switched the ordering of that lottery earlier this year and what we're seeing is about an uptick of about 15 or 20 percent of people who get H-1Bs who actually have advanced degrees. Um, so we're moving towards an environment where, you know, places hopefully that, you know, that need sort of people who are sort of the, the best and brightest, if you will, around the world have a better, better opportunity opportunity to come work and study here in the U.S. Great. Um, so we have that gal there, then Fei Fei, and then the person right there. Hi, my name is Claire Ben. I'm from the Australian National University. Um, and I'd like to talk about the tension between um, innovation and values. So you've talked a lot about U.S. leadership in AI, um, but of course maintaining that leadership might have costs to individual and to society. So for the U.S. to dominate in AI globally might involve um, individuals in society being uh, dominated by government and industry in certain ways or suffering certain harms. So I just wanted to ask, what costs should individuals and society bear in order to maintain U.S. leadership in AI? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't necessarily sort of view the world that way. I think we are are sort of very lucky here in the United States to have forums like this. I think are great examples of the types of values that that underpin the way we view or think about technology and. The, the federal government itself is signing on to, to principles which talk about the very sort of a, a, importance of these values to underpin the development. Some of our, our greatest technology companies, you know, big and small, are, do not hesitate to talk about the, the values that underpin their creation of their technology. And I think these are all examples or indicators of the way that we as sort of Western democracies think about the way that this, this technology can make an impact. And it's markably and remarkably and incredibly different than the way some of our adversaries think about it. So I think it's something for us as the West to sort of celebrate and embrace and say like we're, we're doing it right. It needs a lot of work and there's really smart people who continue to, to sort of think through the challenges but the, the, the alternatives are so scary and so dire and in some ways so terrifying I think as we talked about beforehand that I think we need to continue to, to push efforts like the one we're having here today and continue to have interactions with governments and regulators and civil society about the way that we can move forward to an era where the values that all of us hold dear are ones that are, are baked into the way we use this, this technology in the future. Yep. Fei Fei? Does it work? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michael, for the, the conversation. So we talked a lot about the need to invest in advanced AI and computing technology and R&D and, and so on. Um, as an educator, and there are many educators in this room, especially we're in an education setting, I want to actually go to the other direction and talk about the upstream issues and the pipeline issue, which is policies related to our country's uh, STEM education, especially in the early years, K to 12. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I think, you know, no matter wh how much we invest in the advanced R&D and, and uh, uh, technology, we need that pipeline of talent, uh, especially in this uh, environment of global competition. What is this administration's policy and effort in uh, boosting our STEM and computing and related education? And also, uh, highly related to this, uh, what really concerns me, one of the biggest issues that concerns me is the lack of representation. In, uh, in the pipeline of talents in AI and computing. Hmm. Yesterday we had wonderful um, 
presentations about the harm of um, bias in machine learning, and a lot of that are caused by the lack of representation, and uh, well, in data, but really in the developers of this technology. So whether it's women or underrepresented minority or geographical uh, underrepresentation in many parts of the country. So how is this administration and, and also working with Congress and other uh, agencies thinking about investing in K-12 STEM computing education, especially on the issue of diversity and, and inclusion? Yeah, absolutely. It's something that we're, we're actually very proud of. So, so Congress about, about 10 years ago passed uh, American Competes, which is a, a bill which required our office to produce a, a five-year strategic plan on, on STEM education. And I think the, the thinking behind Congress at the time was that it's not only the Department of Education that's working on STEM-related programs, it's lots of our agencies all across, all across government and having a way to sort of bring those agencies together and all their programs together to, to, to drive sort of um, STEM results was critical. So um, the first plan was put out. Uh, uh, you know, about uh, about five years ago, and we released ours last um, last December. And I think one of the the, the pillars of, of the strategy that came out was the exact thing that you're talking about of how to, how you can find or uh, or push forward with underrepresented minorities and women and other folks into STEM into STEM fields. And you know, we've had a STEM lead at our office for for a while now who's been sort of driving this message. And I think that was sort of layered on with the, the presidential memorandum that that I mentioned a little bit earlier, where we've made sort of a, a commitment at sort of the the, the presidential level to prioritizing STEM with a focus on, on computer science. Um, so for us, these are efforts that we, we continue to work very hard on, and to, to anyone sort of in this room who wants to, to collaborate more, we can certainly connect you with the folks in our office who are working it. I think what's, what remains challenging kind of at a very macro level in the United States is, you know, the federal government can play a, port, in a very important and critical role in kind of setting high-level goals and driving larger picture agendas, but an most of the work is done at the sort of state and local level. And our our ability to sort of find ways to, to build those connections and how we can be helpful in, in those communities is, uh, is something we can always do better at. I just want to make one comment joining Fei-Fei's question with the earlier question about the tension between uh, norms and innovation. And my observation is that this is an optimistic point, that, that the, the tech community, the CS community has come to recognize what you just said, inclusion and diversity in data in the coding community is essential to winning on AI. Yeah. And they go together. You know, that, that's the breakthrough. And so I think that's the kind of thing that makes me feel somewhat optimistic that we can actually hold this tension between values and leadership and innovative, uh, you know, keeping that innovative community at the same time we respect our values. Um, this, Right there, and then right there. Yeah. Hi, I'd like to um, uh, double click on the conversation around bias and, and inclusion, uh, particularly with regards to the comments that were made earlier about facial recognition. Uh, frequently, the example of finding missing children is given as uh, justification for why we should not be restricting the use of facial recognition. Uh, there's quite a bit of evidence, and Joy gave a wonderful presentation, as she always does, about the harms of facial recognition, the bias in the data, and how it's being used. So I would love to hear more about your thoughts of how the government in particular is thinking about how it's going to use facial recognition knowing as we do how biased the current data is and how harmful it can be when it's not used properly with restrictions. Can you, uh, since I know who you are, can you just tell people who, where you come from and what you do? My name is Kathy Baxter. I'm architect of ethical AI at Salesforce. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a fantastic question. I think just like the use of any other technology that the federal government undertakes, it's one that requires sort of a, a lengthy and thorough and thoughtful process on, on the types of issues that may or could happen, and this requires stakeholder engagement and communication and all the things that we talk about, the ideas of fairness, of accountability, of robustness, of trustworthiness. These are all not just words that we throw around. These are things that we want to bake into the types of rules and regulations and procedures that underpin the use cases of any 
any technology that include could include facial recognition. So having very smart people like you and Joy and anyone else in those conversations as we as we build the rules that sort of govern the use cases, I think is, is absolutely critical. And I don't think we're in a position to to jump to use cases where there's clear and obvious bias and and uh, and shouldn't be shouldn't be used. Great, right there. Hi. Uh, so one of the things that DJ mentioned yesterday was uh, how terrible our infrastructure often is within our government agencies. And um, we're talking about, obviously, the, the shiny object, and that is AI and quantum and what we're going to do with it, so on and so forth. But the 80% of it is the data janitorial grunt work, the unsexy stuff. And whether it's at the federal level or at state levels, we don't have a modernized digital infrastructure that, uh, you know, Tumas, I don't know if he's here, uh, former president of Estonia, you know, rolled out, here's our modern digital infrastructure that enables all the services. John mentioned the research in terms of a research cloud. Can you talk about what discussions, what influence uh, are, is happening at the federal level in your office as to how do we actually create this modern digital infrastructure to provide data sets uh, in a way that we can all take advantage of them uh, and other services? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I could not agree more. I think probably one of the, the, the least partisan issues that has been tackled in Washington over the last two decades has been sort of modernizing government technology infrastructure. It's something that everyone agrees is atrocious and needs to be needs to be fixed. I think one of the stats that I was told when I sort of first joined was this, um, you know, that the, the total cost for IT services per federal employee is a neighborhood of, of something like forty thousand dollars a year per federal employee. I think the total IT cost in the private sector, I'm told, are roughly in the neighborhood of like four thousand. So you're looking at a you know order of magnitude difference here. And I think it's highly ineffective. We spend nearly in the neighborhood of like eighty five billion dollars a year on IT at the federal level. These numbers are astronomical, they're, they're eye-watering. So I think we can do we can do a much, much better and more efficient job in using those dollars, and it's something that we as administration have been sort of working at and, and pushing at over the last the last couple of years. I think some efforts which um, you know began in the last administration, which we're continuing, I think are critically important. Programs like the United States Digital Service, where we attempt to bring in sort of talented engineers from Silicon Valley from around the country to come and serve on these sort of SWAT teams of sorts, they're able to go into agencies and help them solve sort of discrete problems problems that they're facing in their, in their IT is critical. Um, I think another program that we're very excited about is the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, the PIF program, where again, sort of mid-career, even early career folks are able to come into the government for a tour of duty for a year or two. They're placed at an agency with usually some, some level of seniority and able to try to make impacts or difference on, on IT more broadly. Um, the larger IT modernization effort and the model that we've tried to push over the last two years uh, is one around centers of excellence. This idea that we have you know, lots of agencies, 25 plus, that all oftentimes need to do the same IT modernization job, if you will, and there's no reason to reinvent the wheel every time. So if you can create a center of excellence on cloud, for example, where you're trying to move agencies from servers to cloud email, I mean, this is the, these are the types of problems we think about, not quite how you implement AI. We're still very rudimentary. If you can have sort of 80% of that knowledge at a, at a center for excellence and you just kind of you know, um, fine tune the last 20 for your specific agency, you can you can make a difference. So we've launched a couple center of excellence for some of our sort of major sort of tech transformation issues. Um, and at an event at the at the White House a couple months ago where we, we hosted an event on AI and government, um, you know, we're in the early stages of launching a, a, a sort of a, an, an AI and in, in government center of excellence, if you will, where you can sort of identify the low hanging fruit of sort of four to five major sort of AI related activities that could benefit multiple agencies and kind of build the groundwork to, to, to do that. Great, right here. Someone's been very patient. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to know how as a CTO, uh, what, what specific initiatives are you personally spending your time and budgetary support on mm -hmm. to protect our democratic elections? So that is not something that our office looks at. Um, that is something that is run out of the uh, out of DHS, and there's an entire team at DHS who focuses on this, who sort of briefs the Hill quite often on this particular issue, and 
Um, and it's something that works very closely with a lot of our state and local governments. As many of you know, the sort of uh, most of the election security related issues are sort of state and local efforts. So we provide help at the federal level on helping them kind of a, a achieve that goal. Um, but uh, to the extent that any of you want to learn more about that, I can sort of happily connect you with our folks at National Security Council, which, uh, which run that process for us. Okay, we're almost coming to a close. I just want to take the prerogative and ask um, two related questions. Mm -hmm. um, there's growing recognition that to succeed at both the normative and the innovation side of this equation, that there has to be much more cross-sector and cross-disciplinary work between hard sciences, social sciences, humanities, as well as between academics, civil society, technologists and industry. Um, and I would say Stanford's HAI High program is a really good indicator of that trend mm -hmm. in you know, having different buckets of work on the technological challenges as well as on the you know, normative and societal challenges. So how does the US government think about the importance of this cross-sector and cross-disciplinary work that has to happen, and how essential is that to U.S. leadership? Uh, it is, and I think one of the, the, the biggest reflections of that is our um, R&D strategic plan on AI that we put out a couple months ago, and one of the sort of the, the eight pillars around that covers these exact issues, these issues of sort of ethics and and the way that we should think about AI, not simply as a, as a sort of technological question, but kind of the the larger social science question. So that's one manifestation of it, and I think, you know, when we have our kind of high-level <coughs> excuse me, White House Committee on this that has sort of the director of National Science Foundation, the, the director of DARPA and so on who kind of meet quarterly on, on AI, these are the types of issues that we bring up and we try to find sort of cross-agency collaboration that can be done on, on thinking about these, these issues. And a big manifestation of that is going to be the, the regulatory guidance memo where we attempt to sort of think about how this technology can be married with the types of, of thinking we should have on, on regulatory and non-regulatory approaches. Great. Okay, last question. What parting advice might you have for the students here who are interested in following in your footsteps getting involved in AI tech policy? Uh, you know, to me, I think there is, uh, you know, doing public service is something that um, everyone should really think about. It is something that I sort of imagined that I would be doing much, much later in life, and an incredible opportunity was presented to me, and, and I've had sort of the, the a, a extraordinarily rewarding experience over the last, the last few years. Um, we live in by far the, the greatest country in the world. The, 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 you know, the, 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 the freedoms, the powers, the, everything that's afforded to us as Americans is something that um, so many people around the world um, do, not, do not have. And we have a, a very, very special country here. We have beautiful universities. We have incredible educational institutions. We have amazing national labs. We have an environment that, um, you know, if we can nurture and foster correctly and well and thoughtfully, we can continue to generate the greatest te technological and scientific discoveries the world has ever known. So anything that anyone wants to do to help drive that, drive that innovation ecosystem forward and help celebrate what this country is, you know, I would be more than happy to talk to you, more than happy to connect you with people who can make that a reality because we live in a very special place. It's a great close. So please join me in saying thank you to Michael thank you. Kratzios. Thank you.